all just like to pay our respects to, to the traditional custodians of the unceded lands in which we live and work and their, acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. As I said, I would like to acknowledge the funders and partners of this project, which are on the banner here, um, without whom we wouldn't have been able to do the project, but also it just makes it so more relevant when you're working with people who are actually working uh, on the ground and all of the community members. So the work that I'm talking about today builds on a seven year programme of research on social connection. Um, the Australian Red Cross originally asked us why there are so many different terms, concepts and ways of looking at social connection and to sort out how they all fit together make them into a tool or framework to enable joined up, coherent, evidence-based actions. So we produced the social connection framework that's in your Social Connection 101 pack that you've been given. For those online, you can find it online via Analysis and Policy Observatory, who are partners in this project. Uh, it sees social connection as having three dimensions. So on the, on the left hand side here um, is an indiv individual model, which is based on the idea of give and get. So you have to give things to get connections. And it uses Robin Dunbar's uh, social brain research, which shows that humans have circles of connection that have different functions. So they have intimate, close connections. They have support connections. They have connections that give them identity from gr various groups or work or education or volunteering. And then they need to feel that they fit in and belong in community. Um, but people can't do social connection on their own. As a couple of you came up to me in, in the break and said, they do need amenable environments. So on the right hand side, uh, we used the evidence to build a community social connection infrastructure framework. And that aspect tells you what um, evidence shows communities need for social connection. And so there are foundations, which are things like safety, choice, access, but there are also designs of places that are more uh, optimal for social connection and activities as well. Uh, and finally, you can put all this in place, but some people still find it hard to connect. And so we have this idea of community connectors, these naturally occurring or employed people who are able to connect people together. And um, we also include in our model a socialization model, because we know that um, when you put two people together, they don't always connect. And as Sammy J asked me this morning, do they become friends? And that is a process. So it's a process that starts with anxiety and confusion. Do I fit in? Is it going to be okay? I f you felt like that this morning when you came into this room, I'm sure, like, who are these people? Will it be okay? And then a process of finding out whether you feel comfortable, whether you fit, and that all takes time. And eventually you might feel that you belong and you start to have quite a lot of ownership of that group. Or over time, you might decide that group isn't for you. You don't fit in there. And that's the socialization part of the model. So we have used this framework as the basis for partnering and co-designing multiple tools and initiatives. So as well as the work that we've done with Australian Red Cross, which um, also included things like a training course, which I think some of you actually came to, so thank you. Uh, we did work with Alliance during the lockdowns um, to make resources and training for staff who were only able to work online. Uh, we also did a project with Inner Southeast Melbourne Metro Partnership Councils, where we were able to map social connection infrastructure on top of um, demographics about at-risk groups to show where the gaps were. And most recently, we have been doing some work with the Salvation Army and uniting around making a social connection assessment tool for residential aged care. So you've no doubt read in many places of a rise in loneliness and social isolation. And we take an action oriented approach that uh, sort of takes on that ongoing moral panic about loneliness. And we just say, okay, well, we get that. Let's try and fix it. 
So our approach is more strengths-based. So we focus on connection, not isolation. Um, it's evidence-based. So we know that there's knowledge in multiple disciplines that's useful for understanding social connection. It's translational, so it's about resources for practice, and it's co-designed with practitioners and experience of community members. And it's holistic, so we understand that connection is about more than individuals doing it for themselves. It's also about collective actions and environments. And as I said, it's action oriented. So, you know, let's do something about it. So the project that we're talking about today, which is focused on outer metro suburbs, um, we have uh, been working to find out how people connect face to face and online um, to understand what helps and hinders connection, to geospatially map social connection infrastructure and to co-design resources uh, implement and measure their impact, advise how to embed connection and planning strategy and policy, and to connect organizations that have goals to grow social connection. So um, the project has three stages, but mainly today I'm gonna to be talking about some findings from year one, phase one of the project, which is really focused on understanding the lived experiences of people in outer metro suburbs. Um, what did we do? Well, we uh, spoke to a number of people. These uh, people were identified through our partner organizations. And the direction to the partner organizations was to find us people with interesting stories of connection. That worked really well because we have quite isolated people, very connected people, people that are on journeys of connection and so on. And the conversations with people covered the circles of connection that I talked about, places of connection, digital connection, um, which Milavan's going to be talking about, and uh, journeys of connection and disconnection. And with each person, there was two two-hour conversations. Okay, you might say, why were these two separate conversations? Well, it's actually a really complicated thing to ask people about their social connections. So, it enables rapport to be built and for people to do some reflection between the interviews. And uh, then we had multiple uh, people coding the data. So the result was 170 plus hours of conversation with 44 community members, um, 35 identified as female, eight as male, one prefer not to say, 64% were born outside of Australia, 57% have a first language other than English. Um, and as you can see from the, the bar chart here, um, there was quite a range of ages. Um, and we did, uh, I think, particularly well to get people in that hard to uh, reach working age group people. So what did we find out? Okay, so first of all, um, we asked people how they see social connection. And this reveals the variety of perspectives and roles of people in our communities. Some people immediately look to themselves and their needs. So for example, Helen here, who her immediate thought was, oh, I think it's that liking you have with a person. It's, it's that kind of energy. It's the energy that you connect with. While others immediately see roles for themselves in making and coordinating community. So Chris here, he talks about social connection for me means you work along with other people in the community towards a fulfilling goal for a greater cause. And Adrian talks about the idea of networks of people that he can connect to each other, but also connect to for different things that he might want to get done in the community. And this means that there are already naturally occurring roles out there in the community, leaders, followers, coordinators, and perspectives where some people are talking about meeting their needs and others are really looking at making community. Okay, so while everyone is different, our data does reveal a set of regularly occurring personas. Um, and these range from people who are more strongly connected to those more weakly connected. Uh, so on the strong side, we have lifelong locals. These are people who've lived in the area all their life. They may have worked locally, 
and they have many connections, sometimes an overwhelming number of connections. They actually talk about how difficult it is to keep up with everybody. And then a second group here are the culturally connected people. And these are in-migrant people with multiple local family and cultural community connections through faith and cultural groups. And then on the weaker um, connection side, we have a couple of groups. The first is what we call community explorers. These are Australian born people, but they've moved around a lot and they are really trying lots of strategies. They have quite frenetic calendars of activities, but there is still a sense of not feeling quite connected. And then there are cultural newcomers and these are in migrants who maybe have one or two connections in the community, such as a relative. But they, again, are trying lots of different activities to connect and not feeling quite connected. So something that was really, I don't know, kind of amazing to me was that some people are really plugged into a connection system. Um, they're embedded in rich, strong, flex flexible connection systems that are around culture, faith, identity. And they connect through relatives, cultural and faith communities, friends of friends, with diverse avenues of, of participation. And these, these kind of connections kind of are local, they're across Australia, they reach internationally to uh, a, a diaspora community. And the interesting thing about these kinds of connect, this kind of connection system is it can be strong or weak. It can be coffee. It can be intense and it's very flexible. So if you've different, uh, gosh, five minutes. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, um, it, an idea here is from Chris who says, my routine is pretty straightforward. Gym, soccer, church, then friends and family. Church is two or three times a week. Youth group, Zoom. Uh, conferences, it's a mix of age groups. So uh, finding out how connection happens. So the most mentioned ways of making new connections were being tapped on the shoulder uh, or learning activities. Uh, and these kind of activities were often juxtaposed by people with this idea of wistful wants. Uh, I, yes, I sure I go to that book group because na my neighbor took me, but actually I want to be in a philosophy group or I want to learn cooking or I want to discuss mental health issues. However, these people invariably seem to think that no one around here would want to do that and it's too hard to get connected. Uh, it might seem odd to think about it like this, but social connection requires work and effort as indicated in our framework. It takes time and people lead busy lives that are exhausting in different ways. Uh, travel, paying the mortgage, keep it, getting your kids to school, etc. And so these quotes kind of illustrate uh, from Iman here, I don't have trouble making friends, just trouble following through and keeping them up. New connections are tiring. As someone with anxiety, it's hard to do a daily thing without having to have social connections. They drain you, you know, they take all of your energy. And so sometimes it's a lot easier to make connections with people that we feel we look like or we can empathize with. And so Callie here talks about uh, finding connection at university difficult, but when she goes to the library in Casey, uh, she sees people who look like her. Relief, she says, when you find people who look like you. You don't have to explain yourself anymore. It's so comfortable having this common ground. So language, accent and cultural differences can raise challenges. Some people live in quite closely monitored family situations and lack their own income, making connections something to be navigated and negotiated. And libraries were reg regularly mentioned as neutral ground. Uh, it's, uh, so one of the things we found was that there was quite a lot of confusion about what they were allowed to do to connect. So rules about connection practices are blurry, whether it's because of the pandemic or societal change, or these out, outer metro suburbs. Uh, I don't know how I can be with people. I smile at the barista, but is that strange? Um, is it okay to ask your neighbors around? Uh, and Brenda says she needs help from others to make this first step because she's a bit of an introvert. Uh, it's good when others can help. So it's almost as though people need some validation about how to connect or a new shared rule book. 
Uh, so some key barriers and enablers, um, places were, that were seen as safe, where um, safety was something that was often mentioned, low cost activities, events around food, um, pets, dog parks. There was an article in the Guardian this morning about dog parks as the new public square, which I thought was really excellent. Um, being asked to go along, community connectors, volunteering, as we've talked about a lot today, flexibility. And some of the barriers are things around language and cultural nuance and complex bureaucratic arrangements, time and other demands, lack of ways to find and approach others with the same interests and just anxiety. Um, I've given some top tips here from the research for community organizations, and uh, these are things like uh, encouraging people to tap each other on the shoulder and facilitating a variety of short term activities, I guess, like try out topic activities, learning opportunities, mentoring for newcomers, tips on strategies to connect when people are new to the area. Helping people to re-understand perhaps acceptable practices of connection and exploring how these connection systems that are associated with these kind of well-connected cultural and faith communities uh, actually work. They're flexible, they have meaning, etc. cetera. Uh, looking at adding incidental spaces to places like libraries and community centers, um, educating staff about how frustrating it is to be constantly asked what, what, it, what it was you said. Look, I have this issue myself, so um, I totally understand. And understanding that connection takes time and it's, it's work. Uh, so the next step in our project is to take all the evidence that we found from the research and from the work that we did uh, to pull together the framework to co-design resources uh, with our partners and community members. So for example, with Red Cross, we are improving a community resilience tool and with Wyndham Council, we're developing a skills and interests ex exchange. And then we'll implement these and measure change using our new suite of measures that, hooray, actually measure social connection that is linked to a theory of change rather than fairly random sets of questions as currently happens. Um, phase three is about developing social connection proofing tools for organizations and policy. Overall, we'll have uh, tools, measures, guides for urban planning and on digital and hybrid connection. This is the last slide, Chris, so you'll be happy. Um, <laughs> so, social connection is fundamental to human well-being and it helps people work together to be resilient. There's currently no joined up science of social connection and language that bridges individual and community perspectives and measurement, just a bewildering array of terms and ideas from different academic disciplines. Social capital was talked about this morning, loneliness, social cohesion, et cetera. Um, these make social connection seem a bit uh, complex when in fact it is actually quite straightforward. Humans evolved over millions of years to live together in smallish kinship groups that allied with other kinship groups. Social connection is fundamentally about feeling loved, safe, supported and fitting in as in Dunbar circles. The ways we live and ideology driving policy is individualistic, constantly pulling us away from each other for jobs, to pay the mortgage, get kids to school. Many of our current solutions are band-aids that target individuals. Taking a multidisciplinary approach, we are partnering to co-produce the first connected evidence-based and action-oriented science of social connection, underpinned by a framework, practical activities and measures. And we hope you'll continue to touch base with us as we move through with this work. Ta-da, that is me done. <laughs>